Hi, in this video uh, we're just going to talk you through the rules and regulations with regards to buy-to-let mortgages. So the video is designed to give you a really good idea of what you need to have in place and what your chances are of being able to get a buy-to-let mortgage. There's a lot of hype at the moment saying it's difficult. Um, it's not as difficult as people think it is. You just need to know what you're doing and you need to know where to get the best deals from. But this video will give you a real idea of whether you do fit the criteria and you are able to do it now or what you need to work towards being able to um, to, to do it. Um, in the market at the moment for a long time, for a couple of years, two, three years, you've needed to have 25% deposits. That's starting to change very slowly. So we now have one lender offering 20% deposits and we have one lender have gone as far as offering 15% deposits. Okay. The benefit of the smaller deposit, obviously, is if you've got a lump of money and you only need to put down a smaller deposit, you can purchase more property. And that's covered fully in our leverage video, which you may find interesting. Um, but, but basically, as a rule, to get the 20% and 15% deposits at the moment is very difficult. They're incredibly tough uh, on credit score. They don't have a lot of money to lend. And we've had people you kind of A grade uh, clients with lots of income declined for no, no particular reason but there isn't a lot of money being lent at that level. The great news though is that banks are starting to lend at that level again um, and what that means is the other banks will want to A be competitive so they'll want to start lending at that level again soon and it's also a good sign that the banks are confident that the property market is in a bit of a sounder footing than it has been. The reason that the bank would want bigger deposits as if they're worried about future falls and, and, and things like that. So the other common thing which I'll come on to shortly is that banks, um, the buy to let lenders generally um, don't get their money to lend to clients from deposit accounts. Now just to explain that a bit more fully, a lot of banks um, where the savings get paid in, the more savings that customers put into savings accounts, the more money they have to lend. So they lend out what customers have put in their saving accounts. The buy to let lenders tend to get the money in different ways. They tend to borrow the money from cash rich banks. So they'll go to a cash rich bank and say, can we borrow 20 million pounds at such and such a rate? And then they'll try and lend that 20 million pounds out to somebody else at a profit. This means the banks need to be lending to each other. And as a lot of us now know, the credit crunch was caused because the banks stopped lending to each other. They didn't trust each other to be able to pay each other back. There was a lot of fear about which banks were in good shape, which were in bad shape. And that led to a freezing up of banks lending to each other. What we've seen in recent weeks and months is more and more banks coming back to the marketplace, more and more banks coming into the buy-to-let marketplace, and that's a fantastic sign for the economy as a whole because it means that banks are starting to lend to each other. Okay, so back to, back to the slide, deposits, 25%, you'll quite comfortably get a mortgage. If you've got 15 or 20%, it's worth asking your broker, they can find out for you. And I think over the months to come, this video will get become out of date because I think more lenders will come back into that marketplace. Okay, if we move on to the next point on the slide, um, loan to value. Um, this is just to explain when somebody talks about loan to value, it's the opposite really of the deposit. If somebody says you can get 75% loan to value, that means if the house is worth 100,000, that they'll lend you 75,000 if it's 75% loan to value. So it's how much they'll lend you compared to the value of the property. The rest being made up by the deposit. If you've got 85% loan to value, it means you only need a 15% deposit to make it up to 100. Rental income rules, the next point on the slide. Now, what we find um, with this, every bank is different, but generally the banks are looking for your rent to be at least 125% of your mortgage payment. Okay, And if you're on an interest-only mortgage, basically you need your rent to be 125% of the interest that you're paying on the mortgage. Now just to give you an example, if you've got a mortgage for £100,000 and you're paying £500 a month for that mortgage, that would be at 6%, then the rent would need to be 125% of that £500. So the rent would need to be £625 a month. Okay. Now the way the bank 
work out the rent isn't from taking your word for it. They, when they send the valuer out to value the property, they also ask the valuer to put a value on for rent. The valuers tend to be cautious on this, so they will mark that down. Um, so it's worth, if you've got a tenancy agreement, you've got a regular tenant in place, when you're showing the value around, have the tenancy agreement with you to show them as evidence. If it's a new property that you're buying, um, then maybe get a couple of letters from local letting agents saying what they believe you can rent it for and try and have those on site when the value is going around the property. Okay, doesn't always make a difference, but yeah, the rent needs to be 125% of the interest. You want it to cover that anyway to meet the key rules in property purchasing, which are covered on our, our, our other video, but you must have cash flow positive properties and therefore you don't want to be buying them if they don't cover that. Some lenders look for 130%, some lenders have slightly different rules, but if you use that as a rule of thumb, you'll generally be okay. The next point on the slide is just about every lender in buy to let at the moment will look for you to have your name on the deeds of another property. Whether it's a residential property that you live in or another buy to let property, they want to know that you've owned that you've owned a property before. They're not necessarily looking for you to have had a mortgage on it. So if it's paid off, that's fine. But they want to know you've owned a property before and you've had that responsibility. In the current market, they're not lending to people who are just buying the first property and the first property is a buy to let. Okay, so if you're looking to buy your first property and you were wanting to buy to let it, then the, there are some lenders that will allow you to buy it as a residence and as long as you've lived there for a period of time, then approach them for a consent to let um, and look to let it out later. But you need to have lived there first for a period of time. Um, again, speak to a mortgage broker about that and they'll be able to advise you best in this, in this specific scenario. Okay. Um, Arrangement fees. Now coming on to arrangement fees, the lenders at the moment haven't had a very competitive market. So up until June of 2010, there were two, two main lenders were lending at least 80% of the money being lent. So they were able to charge arrangement fees of about 25 or 3% of the balance you were borrowing. For example, if you were borrowing £100,000, they could charge 25 or £3,000 in arrangement fees to borrow that money. However, as more lenders come into the market, we get more competition. So at the back end of 2010, we had uh, Coventry Building Society, Godiva Mortgages enter the market, and to get their name well known again, they put their arrangement fees at £300. The other lenders had to react to that. The other lenders had to stay competitive, so all the arrangement fees got dropped for about a month. Godiva got re-established in the market, and then the lenders slowly, as a group, put their arrangement fees back up again but they didn't go back up quite as far as where they'd been before. So every time you hear news about a new lender coming back into the market, it's not only good because there's a new lender lending, but it makes more competition, and therefore the banks have to get keener on the price that they offer you, which makes a better deal for the investor. So we have seen in the last couple of months, uh, February and March, we've seen arrangement fees get more competitive. So if you haven't reviewed buy to let for a couple of months, then it is worth reviewing and I do believe as the months go on it will get more and more competitive so keep looking, keep checking. I wouldn't hold fire from buying a property for that reason, I wouldn't think oh, I'll wait six months and buy in six months because the fees will be cheaper because you'll have missed out on six months of rent and six months of growth and getting going with things. So don't use that as a reason not to buy but do use it as a reason to review if you haven't reviewed recently. Credit history. Um, the banks at the moment can be choosy with buy-to-lets. There's lots of people wanting buy-to-let mortgages. So if you've got defaults or county court judgments in, on your credit file, i.e. in the last six months you've had defaults or county court judgments, or if you've missed a lot of payments on uh, credit cards or loans or you go over your overdraft limit, it's fine to go into your overdraft, but you go over your overdraft limit often, these things are going to cause you issues. They may well present you, uh, prevent you from being able to borrow money at the moment. Um, so it's very important to keep on top of your credit file at the moment, very important to make sure that, you, that you're credit worthy. Again, the lenders are starting to come in, back into the market who will look at things a bit more favourably. They'll look at somebody who's got a smaller CCJ if it's two or three years old. They'll look at somebody who's maybe had a default over three years old. They'll look at somebody with a couple of missed payments, uh, or late payments should I say. But it is difficult, so again, tell the broker early, be totally honest with them. You can go to a website 
experian.co.uk it's on the bottom of the screen you can go to that website and you can get information um, about your credit file it is a free trial for 30 days so you can log on see what the banks can see see what payments you've missed again have a look at that get that across to your broker and they'll be able to tell you very early whether that's going to prevent you or cause you problems um, but do use expert brokers do use brokers that expertise in buy to let um, a normal everyday broker may not do that many buy to let mortgages so you somebody who really knows about buy to let and they can make sure you're getting absolutely the best deal and if you have got bad credit they can make sure they've checked everything thoroughly for you we've put up HMO on the slide some people say what's HMO it's house of multiple occupants say um, the lenders definition of HMO and the local council's definition are actually different which is crazy but they are different so in this particular video what I'm talking about is the lenders definition it's what they define as being a house that has multiple people living in it and therefore they see it as more risky if they had to repossess that property it would take them longer to deal with it because they might have four individuals living in it or five or whatever it may be a house of multiple occupancy is either a block of flats so if you've got flats with different doorways into the main into their flat three flats in one building for example you own the whole building but there's three separate front doors with three separate people living in it that's a house of multiple occupancy if you've got a big house rented out to a group of people for example students five students if they're all on one tenancy and it's one tenancy agreement that's different to them all having individual tenancies some landlords will rent to the students individually and then if one student leaves they've still got the other four the problem with that is again that's seen as a house of multiple occupancy it's more of a risk for the lender okay if you've got a property with more than one kitchen in it multiple bathrooms is fine but more than one kitchen again it's a house of multiple occupancy different people are cooking in different areas they, cut, they, they consider them different family units up until about four or five months ago it was very 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 difficult to get mortgages for, for HMOs um, the market's just starting to open up again you either need to go for commercial lending which is different to buy to let or there are one stroke two buy to let lenders just coming back into the market for HMO mortgages so you haven't got a lot of choice it's not very competitive they look for you having for example at the moment three years of landlord history so if you're buying your first house and you want an HMO they're not really interested you need to go down the commercial route again I'd advise you to speak to your broker early and they can let you know what you can do and what you can't do but, but they will find ways of doing things for you you're looking at about 30% deposits for HMOs 30 to 35 even but 30% 30, 30 you should be able to get in the game okay and the last point I'll make um, on the slide here, you've seen it all the way through as, I, as I've been talking, use an expert for this part of the job. A broker will understand the marketplace, they'll understand all the different lenders, all the different deals that are out there, they'll know when a new lender is coming back into the market, if they're a good broker. Um, and if they save you just 1% on the interest rate uh, and you've borrowed £100,000, that's £1,000 saving over the year, so the broker can be well worth their fees in terms of the savings that they'll make you over, over various deals. Okay, I hope that's helped you, and uh, good, good luck with finding the right mortgages.